Now, we're in officially in the year of 2024. Of course, if you turn on the TV or turn to the media, that too often today we only pay attention to a lot more geopolitical change. And not only we'll look at the war in Ukraine, and also we'll look at this presidential election and the U.S. However, but at the end of the day, I think in addition to everything going on, we need to ask the question, what is the real purpose of life? You know, we think about it. I mean, it doesn't matter if we were looking for financial stability or we're looking for this satisfaction from having、uh, more family members and friends around in our life. But the ultimately, the answer should be, well, it's about the purpose. It's really about the goal trying to accomplish. You know, too often we tend to say that when you're adults, and especially after becoming fathers, or you know,、uh, or becoming this、um, uh, much shoulder much greater responsibilities, and we tend to overlook the interests and the challenges that we try to pursue. However, it is not too late, especially for our author. I mean, the、uh, special guest today, that in the midst of the pandemic and the midst of the whole uncertainty. That our distinguished speaker today and found something rather interesting and also that can be rather profound and for his own life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is the Mr. Patrick Ashomanek. Again, Patrick is an economic advisor and former chief strategist at Silvercrest Asset Management, and based in New York City. And he spent much of his life in China and taught at Tsinghua University in Beijing and Columbia University Schools of International and Public Affairs. Of course, that if you're familiar with、uh, Patrick, and he wrote a book which is called. Cleared for the option for readers to share the curiosity he had about what pilot actually learned and do to become pilot. Well, Mr. Shomanek, and welcome to the missing piece. Hi, thank you very much for that very appropriate introduction, because、uh, it really touched upon a lot of things that, that motivated me both to learn to fly and then to write a book about it and share that experience with other people. Of course, Mr. Shovenek. I mean, it's very exciting. Again, I have to say that as soon as I got a handle of your copy of your book and I dive into it, it's so enlightening, and also again, it triggers so much about the curiosity of flying. But let's dive into it. And also, I realized that you also wrote several articles about your experience of becoming a pilot. Now, let's talk about this. I know within one article, this is what you wrote, and I quote. We fly all the time for business, for vacation, but most of us traveling by planes is like a magic carpet ride, and the pilot are the genies. We rarely give much thought to what make it possible, and when we do, it tend to make us nervous. Now, <laughs> can you help us with better understanding? Again, I mean, as a frequent flyer as I am, and also, of course, you are, that it's much easier to get on the flight and enjoy the flight. But meanwhile, that becoming a pilot, can you share with us the story behind the book? That what really motivated you and drove you to become a pilot, and also, of course, how would you explain this whole nervousness that during the experience? Go ahead. So、um, I have been a passenger for most of my life,、um, and、uh, not always a very comfortable one.、Uh, And I never ever expected to learn how to fly. It was something that I thought other people do, who are somehow have the talent for it or are more capable, and that would never be something that I would do. And then the pandemic hit, and I live in New York City,、mm. and we were all kind of locked into our apartments and spending months and months in each other's faces. Without much to do, and I think it actually drove a lot of people crazy.、Mm. Um, it, it did. I say that with a smile on my face, but really, it, the isolation and the loss of normal routine and purpose,、mm. and people saying that they that a whole year has been wasted,、uh, I think took a toll on a lot of people's happiness and even mental health. And it helped to have some kind of focus. And I stumbled upon this.、Uh, I was sitting. In June of 2020,、um, watching YouTube with my son and looking at different things, and we looked at what kind of computer games are going to come out.、Mm. And Microsoft Flight Simulator 
was just about to come out and they had a, a promotional video and we looked at it. We said, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, I'm, I have followed computer games since I was a kid mm. playing on an Apple II. And I've always amazed at how the, the leaps and bounds that have taken place in terms of representing reality uh, on a computer screen. And we were just amazed. You, you, you looked at photos or screenshots and you couldn't tell the difference between a real photo and, and the game. So I said, wow, this is kind of cool. And I, I always loved to travel and mm. I couldn't travel at that time. And this was kind of a virtual way of traveling. I said, but okay, we can buy the game but I'm going to have to learn how to actually fly an airplane, at least on the computer to be able to do this. I have to learn how to play this game. And um, I bought the equipment. I said, I'm going to, okay, what else am I going to do? Uh, it's, I'm, it's lockdown. So I, I bought the equipment and I started playing. And as I began playing, I had all these questions. First of all, I, I actually could land the plane mm. uh, amazingly uh, on the computer screen, at least, but I had all kinds of questions about, what, why do you do this? And when do you do that? And how do you talk to air traffic control, et cetera? And I started watching YouTube videos and then that wasn't enough. So I signed up for what they call online ground school. They used mm. to just teach ground school courses to pilots before they mm. hopped in an airplane. And now it's all online. So you watch a series of videos, you take a series of tests. And I just did this purely out of curiosity to, to know more about what was happening. But when you're taking, when you're watching these videos, they're saying things like, well, when you're in the plane with your instructor, when you're practicing landing, and I thought, well, these people kind of expect me to do this. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not such a far-fetched thing. Mm. And I signed up for my first lesson in October, actually Halloween of uh, 2020. And a year later, got my license. And I, I learned an immense amount in the process about about airplanes, mm. about uh, about flying, uh, made me feel a lot better about being a passenger because I knew what was happening and what was going on. And I thought that whether you intend to learn to fly or not, some people, they think in the back of their mind, well, maybe I could do that. Mm. But then they kind of put it aside and say, well, <laughs> maybe, but maybe not. And 80% of the people who even start drop out. Mm -hmm. because it can be a lonely and challenging process. Right. And there are times when you're banging your head against the wall and you can't figure out what you're doing wrong. And a lot of people drop out. But even if you're not interested in learning to fly, like I say, flying is something that we all do. Mm -hmm. And it's part of our lives. And I'm never going to become a doctor, but I read books about medicine. I read books about what doctors do because it's part of our modern world. And I'm curious about it. And learning about it, having some knowledge about it is sort of helpful and even useful uh, at some point. So I, I thought that there were probably a lot of people who felt the same way, that uh, flying is something we all do, but we don't think about that much. And it's useful to kind of understand what it is that pilots do. Well, Mr. Chauvinek, again, it's so inspiring and motivational to hear that a simple taste of curiosity that can motivate all of us to take actions behind our words. Now, let's talk a little bit something deeper about your fly experience. I know in your book, you also mentioned something about we study or how we normally think about the air. I mean, again, like you think about it as a passenger that when we get on the plane and then we fly high in the sky, that we were above the ground and we have time to say, wow, this is really cool. You know, when you look at the views outside the window, it's mesmerizing. But also that you, in your book, you mentioned that it, understanding the flight is changing how we think about the air. So let's talk a, a little bit more about this. So what, what did you learn? What, what have you discovered regarding that becoming a pilot or flying up in the air and something that changed your understanding or your comprehension about the air. What was it? Well, I think we all, when we are looking out the window of an airliner, it's it's beautiful, but then we think, what is holding me up? <laughs> I, I have no idea what's holding me up. <laughs> Science tells me that it works. I can see that it works, but how is this happening? Because we tend to think of the air as being something insubstantial because yes. we can't see it. Yes. We can feel it maybe, 
but we can't see it. Right. And I do recall one time when I was traveling in Britain mm. um, and I was standing on a cliff and there was 80 mile an hour wind from uh, a storm offshore and it was coming in and it would just knock me down. I had to actually get down on my knees and crawl mm. because it was so forceful. And that actually is the force that that is the substance of the air that actually can hold up an airplane. Uh, it's very powerful. So as you learn to fly, you begin to realize that it's like you're swimming through water. Mm. You are you are flying through this medium that actually, even though you can't see it, you can definitely learn to feel it mm. and you can learn if you can feel the effect that it's having. In fact, a lot of intuitively learning to fly and the practice of learning to fly is picking up that feel for what is the air doing and mm. how is my how is it holding up my plane and what do i need to do to to avoid dangerous circumstances because the thing that you always want to avoid in an airplane is called a stall mm. and a stall doesn't mean that your that your engine stops working it, it means that the um that the air is no longer holding up your wings mm. and they're long, no longer providing lift. And usually that's because you're flying too slow, but it could be because you're flying at too great of an angle and all kinds of things like that. So you begin, especially as you learn to land, because landing is actually a process of stalling, intentionally stalling the airplane right above the runway. Mm. And it is an exercise in energy management and it's an exercise in having a feel for what the the air around you that's holding up the plane mm. um it 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 takes a it takes a bit of a leap of imagination because again it's something that is invisible and yet is very real you know mr chauvinick as i was listening to the description that you just mentioned i guess the word that came to my mind it's called it's rather majestic you know it's rather difficult to imagine that feel that when you are up in the air as a passenger, but meanwhile, you're actually the driver behind that wheels and to drive the plane. Now, you know, if we can trace back to the history about flying, of, of course, that it's well known that everyone um, are familiar with the Wright brothers. You know, I think that was the brown breaking record. That was a brown breaking that historical facts that regarding that, you know, again, we are actually humans could actually fly and drive an engine. But there's an interesting quote and you put in the book and also you put in the, uh, uh, the article. It's called, as the old saying goes, that it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. You know, again, I have to say that, again, the more I read about your book, and also, of course, I share that with a lot of my friends with me, and here's a question I want to ask you is, how did you feel the first time that you actually, you know, again, not listening to uh, uh, the uh, uh, the voice on YouTube or not watching the video on YouTube, but actually got the behind the wheels and then started to fly and started to become a pilot? And so what was that feeling? What was that sensation? And also, did you ever think about that quote to say, hey, it's better that to be on the ground wishing I was in the air than in the air wishing I was on the ground? Can you talk a little bit more about that? So I should explain that that quote actually is about weather and okay. the danger of weather, right? It's not a discouragement to go up and fly, but it's basically saying that the pilot, I, I didn't realize how much pilots have to pay attention to the weather. It's almost like a sailor. Uh, and there are things, especially with small plane conditions, where you don't want to go up mm. because uh, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. Uh, you can get icing. You can get uh, you you can get knocked up and down. Uh, so even today, with airliners, when we hear that our flight has been delayed due to weather, we kind of go, oh, "Come on, that's not possible. I mean, we can fly through anything." But it is actually not true. Mm -hmm. you, they really have to be aware of that. That said, um, how did it feel to be in the plane as opposed to in front of a computer screen? Uh, a sense of disbelief. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first took off, 
um, and and the 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 instructor actually had me do the takeoff. Uh, you know, you're 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 you you you're you're uh, you you lift off your your wheels lift off from the ground, and all of a sudden you're flying and you're thinking this is really happening. This is this is amazing. <laughs> um, you you never quite lose that. I think uh, there were times when I was doing cross country long distance flights on my own solo, and all of a sudden I'd look around and say, "Wow, I'm." thousand feet two thousand feet over new jersey and and i'm alone Uh, this is this is me doing this so there's always that element you are focused Mm -hmm. and i think you have a lot of tasks and you have a lot of things to pay attention to and so that takes away a lot of the fear uh when you're landing it is something to see the ground rush up at you, especially the first few times. And it's real ground. It's not something on a computer screen. And uh, you, you have to learn to develop the confidence that you know what you're doing. But eventually, you're so focused on what you're doing. It's kind of like people who get car sick, usually, it's not usually the driver. It's mm. usually somebody sitting mm. in a passenger seat because the driver is focused on what they're doing. Right. And they have a sense of control of what right. they're doing. And so it, it's very similar when you're in the pilot seat of an airplane. You, uh, you've got a lot to think about, a lot's going on, and you don't have time to be scared. Well, Mr. Schulman, I want to talk about, again, going back to uh, your experience talking about that being a pilot, that you have to stay focused. Now, let's talk about that. We know it's rather difficult today, especially that when we talk about being focused or stay focused, because, you know, again, we have a lot of noises and we have a lot of distractions. And but again, because your story and your experience is so fascinating that let's talk about this, that when you're actually flying, I mean, again, you're the pilot and you're sitting behind the wheels and flying when you have those moments that you say wow i'm actually up in the air and i'm flying but meanwhile you have to be focused for what you're doing and i think this apply to our uh, uh, kind of the principle in life or the rules in life in general as well is when we are being focused there will be noises and there will be distractions, but we have to stay focused so we know where you're going. So again, going back to the experience and going back to what you wrote in the book, how difficult it is to be focused when you're actually driving, when you're actually flying. That again, I mean, I have to say that, you know, being a passenger, we take pictures, you know, we want to take selfies, so we want to show off and we want to do all of that. But when you are driving the airplane and you're saying that this is not a computer game, this is not a YouTube clip, <laughs> that you actually have to stay focused. So how did you deal with the balance between being focused and not to get distracted, but meanwhile still enjoy the experience, enjoy the full measure of the whole, uh, what we say, the sensation? Can you talk a little bit more? Being focused is quite important. Not being distracted is quite important. In fact, a lot of the accidents that do take place uh, are due to people being distracted Mm. at different times. And so you have to be very aware of your state of mind while you're flying and also when you're deciding whether to fly at all. There are times when you, to get back to that quote about better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air, there are times when you actually have to say, look, I'm not in the correct state of mind. There are external pressures uh, I, I'm distracted by something and I, I just can't, I shouldn't do that. Maybe I shouldn't fly at all, or maybe mm-hmm. I should just take a moment to collect myself. Uh, famously, John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, died in a plane accident. Mm. Uh, and if you go back and you analyze why that happened, he was under a lot of pressure to be at a wedding. Uh, he was running behind. There, he had passengers who might have been talking about the same thing. There were a lot of mistakes that were made because he didn't, he, he, he wasn't focused. Mm. And, and it can cost you your life. Mm. Uh, however, one thing also that I learned about flying is that the airplane wants to fly. Mm. 
So uh, a lot of people imagine that you have to constantly be on the controls and constantly be uh, telling the plane exactly where to go. That's not quite true. You have to be aware of what's happening, but there's a thing called trim, which is where you, you spin a wheel and you can basically keep the airplane flying in the same direction it's going. You don't have autopilot. You could have, you could have autopilot, which then would do more of that for you. But even without autopilot, you can arrange the airplane. You can set up the airplane so that it essentially continues to fly in the same direction. And that gives you a little bit of a chance to look at your maps, to look out the window, even take a selfie if you're not in a critical uh, phase of flight, like landing, and you don't immediately spin out of control. Helicopters, by the way, are very different. I took a helicopter lesson uh, just to kind of compare, mm. and helicopters require constant uh, adjustment. You cannot mm. take your hand off of those controls for one moment mm. uh, or else because a helicopter is very unstable, which is also what makes a helicopter, a helicopter very agile. Mm. But, uh, but air, there are a lot of misconceptions about airplanes that if you take your hands off the wheel <laughs> of the yoke for a moment, it'll go careening off in the direction. Or if your engine stops that you'll just fall from the sky, which is not true either. You can glide for a considerable distance to find a safe place to land. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you do have a moment actually up there. Uh, and there were a few moments that I write about through the book where, all right, I'm so focused on what I'm doing. And then finally I get to a point where I can look around mm. and actually enjoy the flight a little bit, <laughs> a little bit for a moment. <laughs> of course. Well, Mr. Chauvin, I, I got two more questions before letting you go. Now let's talk about, um, again, going back to the whole experience. And again, this is something that you wrote in the article, and I want to get you a, a further explanation. And this is what you wrote, and I quote, We all fly, but in the rush of our lives, we tend to regard it as either a mundane chore or an appropriate mystery. Uh, in a, an unapproachable mystery, excuse me. What well, flying can be instead is a venture well worth the effort to appreciate and understand. What does that mean, by the way? I mean, again, of course, then not everyone has the luxury and has the uh, capability as you did that become a pilot and enjoy enjoying this. But coming back to the word adventure and coming back to the word, I guess they called step out the comfort zone. You know, we have the curiosities and we have the drive to really discover something unknown or something bigger about ourselves. But in the end, I guess going back to what you said before is the word called fear that too often we allow fear to stand in the way or we allow fear to become the excuses or the hurdles that prevent us from moving forward. So going so again, going back to what you just wrote and what would you want to say to that? You, you, you said it well in terms of your fear and and also just inertia mm. of life being the real obstacle you you refer to it as a luxury and it is true that it can be expensive in terms mm. of time and, and money to to learn how to fly but it's all about priorities though mm. um there are there are people who i know who say oh i'd love to travel but i they never get around to it mm. and it's you can do it um and you can do it you can travel cheap fairly cheaply it's not that expensive um, you just have to make it a priority. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I know people who are of fairly modest means who find a way to learn how to fly if that's something that they truly want to do. Um, it really is about making that decision. And I was 50 years old. I'm 54 now, just turned 54. And uh, I was 50 when I began learning to fly. And when you're 50, you don't usually learn new things, quite frankly. Uh, you you pretty much learn the things that you're good at. And you tend to assume, by the way, that the things that you're good at are natural, that everybody should be good at those things. And if they're not, what's wrong with them? And that those other things are, well, either specialties or uh, not relevant. And it is something to make a decision to do something very different to sit down next to an instructor who is half your age and yet knows something that you do not mm. and 
to patiently learn what it is that you don't know. And it doesn't really matter what that is. It can be flying. And that's kind of the broader purpose of the book. Part of it is to inform people about this incredibly interesting thing called flying that we all do, but don't think about that much. Uh, But the other part of it is to simply say that there is no, there is really no barrier to learning how to do something new, Mm. except your willingness to do it. And Mm. it's a humbling process, but it's a rewarding process. And your world expands. So there was this world that I didn't really know about before, about flying that maybe I encountered, but didn't really delve into. And now it's a world that I'm part of and can help explain to other people. And that I think is a great thing about learning anything new. Mm. It could be learning how to paint. It could be learning how to play chess. It could be anything. Uh, It doesn't really matter. Mm. Mr. Shomenek, I want to ask you uh, the last question. Again, going back to the title of your book, it's called Clear for the Option. I mean, again, um, I'm still uh, uh, diving into this amazing book. And again, I still have a lot more stories to be discovered throughout the experience. But let's just say for any of the readers that who aren't familiar with who you are and are familiar with the stories that you uh, wrote in the book, what would you expect the readers to understand? Or what would you um, hope the readers can understand, appreciate when they finish reading the last page of your book? What are your final thoughts? Well, if people do know who I am, this is not the book that they expected me to write. Uh, I'm an economist. I lived in China. I, I, uh, most people said, oh, you're writing a book about China, right? You're writing a book about uh, economics, right? No. Uh, And, Partly I did this to teach myself how to write a book because I was good at writing essays, but always I was very daunted about the prospect of writing a book. Uh, So I did learn two new things in this process. Um, Clear for the option refers to an air traffic control instruction Mm. that you receive when you are coming into land. And they could say cleared for landing, um, but cleared for the option means that the runway is yours. You could do what you want. You could... And especially when you're practicing, you can either land and stop, you can land and take off again, you can uh, come in for a low approach, which is sort of a practice landing. You do what you want. The runway is yours. And I just found that a metaphor for what I was just talking about, which is that that life is open Mm. and you can do what you want Mm. if you choose to go down that path. and this was a path that was very surprising to me, and I wanted to share with people, even if it was not on brand. Uh, uh, and and that's the other thing is, is that I think sometimes we get so focused on being on brand. Mm. My brand is I'm the economist who talks about China, uh, and people that's what people expect to hear from me, and that's why they invite me on to talk. And you can do something that's off brand, but it's genuinely part of you. Mm. And that also is part of the takeaway, which is you don't you don't have to be in your lane. You can go into can go into other lanes uh, as long as you as long as you approach it in a disciplined way um, and take it seriously. Because mm. obviously, learning to fly is not something that you just do on a lark. It's something that you actually commit to, uh, and it is a challenging process. Of course, again, going back to what you said. And just be more open-minded, and life is open for everyone, for many options. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Mr. Patrick Kovanek. Again, um, Mr. Kovanek is an economic advisor and the former chief strategist at Silvercrest Asset Management and based in New York City. Again, I strongly encourage everyone to go online and check out his new book. It's called Cleared for the Option. And again, it's an amazing book to talk about his experience of learning how to fly and becoming a pilot, and most importantly, to understand more about the lessons that we out accumulate over life. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure, and we'd love to have you back on the show as we continue to discuss more about your book and also about the matters around the world. Thank you so much thank for doing this. Thank you very much.